So I uh, don't have a whole lot of uh, new data since the winter meetings, but I'm going to hit some key points and then I'm going to talk a little bit about biology of some sugarcane pests, particularly as it relates to uh, winter survival and hopefully this will be informative, particularly to some of the, the newer agents on the on the call. Uh, so some New developments from last year, we saw the Mexican rice borer expand northward into Rapides and Avoyles parishes. Uh, that's the first northward expansion we've seen in, in some time. And in those areas, uh, we saw quite a bit of infestations reaching uh, potentially damaging levels and uh, a lot of acres had to be sprayed. So <clears throat> it shows you this pest is, is continuing to advance and a lot of these parishes we're starting to see a complex of stem borers where Mexican rice borer and sugarcane borer are occurring in the fields uh, in the same fields but out west we're particularly in Vermilion Parish we're starting to see uh, Mexican rice borer emerge as the, the most prevalent stem borer. Where they both do occur uh, you can tell them apart fairly easily if you if you know some key features to look at. The Mexican rice borer has a light colored head capsule and pairs of uh, parallel stripes, these broken dotted lines here, versus the sugarcane borer with the dark head capsule and spots and larger larvae tend to have pretty clear uh, bristles or hairs along their bodies. Some of our recent insecticide work has uh, been fairly conclusive in showing the residual activity or how long these products can provide protection from bores. Uh, Prevathon really stands out here. I think we're getting close to eight weeks of protection during the summer. Uh, and we're getting full systemic activity where even leaf tissue that wasn't present at the time of application will have uh, effective concentrations of that chemical. And this is really, uh, I think, going to reduce the need to come back and have a, a second spray in some fields that were sprayed early. I think that long length of protection will limit most fields to just a single application if needed. Some changes to the insecticide picture uh, moving forward. Confirm is no longer being manufactured. Uh, you're still able to buy it or use it, it's still registered if it's available to you, but I think uh, in the future it's it's not going to be available unless it's picked up as a generic somewhere. And this was a decision by Gowan because really the sugarcane market in Louisiana was the, the biggest market for this uh, product. And as we switched more to Prevathon, uh, they decided it was no longer uh, practical to keep that chemical in production. Vanticore is going to replace Prevathon. This is the same chemical, it's just a, a new formulation. It's about uh, close to 10 times more concentrated, so your rates will be adjusted down instead of these uh, 14 to 20 ounces. You'd get uh, 1.2 to 1.7. Also, the maximum rate is increased. Um, I don't see the need for this really. We get good control with the lower the lower weight rate, which used to be 14 ounces for Prevathon. Uh, going up to this this higher rate is, is excessive. Uh, look at some of the ore resistance in our newer varieties. Uh, we do have some level of resistance in 615 and in the newly released 739. <clears throat> 201 is among the most susceptible varieties we've ever evaluated. Uh, 183 is also susceptible, not quite on the same level, but 201 is one you're going to have to be real uh, cautious where you're planting it to make sure uh, you can spray it the bores if needed, because that's very likely going to be needed in, in many years. So looking at the freeze we had uh, <clears throat> going into the winter meetings, it had appeared this was going to be a, a mild winter and for most of it it was. However, the Mardi Gras freeze 
cell temperatures get well below normal uh, normal winter minimums in a lot of areas, particularly uh, further west and north. And a lot of uh, general opinion is that these hard freezes will limit insect pest pressure in the summer. Sometimes that's the case and, and sometimes it isn't. So I'm going to try to break down uh, how we can expect these pests to respond. Just quickly cover uh, overwintering behavior of both our boar species, sugarcane boar and Mexican rice boar. Uh, they go into the winter as mature larvae, uh, typically their last stage larvae, fifth in stars, and they're overwintering in a number of different places, plant cane tillers, particularly if you've got a full, fully formed internodes uh, there. Also, the sugarcane boar will overwinter in mature uh, stubble pieces, those kind of mother stalks to the stubble crops that are right at the soil surface or even underground. Rice stubble and non-crop grasses are also sources of both. Uh, rice stubble is particularly big source of overwintering boars for the Mexican rice boar. Once the winter starts to come to an end and days get longer, the larvae will pupate. Uh, this is the sugarcane boar on the left. It's quite a bit larger as a pupate. And a week to two weeks later, the adults will emerge from those overwintering habitats, mate, and then uh, begin laying eggs on the new host material, including a lot of uh, spring sugarcane tillers. And each female can lay about 200 to 300 eggs. And so a small number of, uh, a small population of insects in the overwintering generation still has potential to produce a substantial first generation population in the spring. Uh, in April and May, those larvae will begin feeding in sugarcane fields and causing what we call dead hearts. And going back uh, to 2003, we've done dead heart surveys in May to quantify this first generation in the spring and see uh, what we might expect in terms of summer infestation levels. And I'll show you uh, some of those data. This is looking at dead heart density here on the y-axis versus minimum winter temperature. And what I want you to take home is there really is no relationship between winter temperatures and that first generation in the spring. Uh, we're kind of all over the map here. This very low value indicates that this is not well correlated at all. Even in some cold years, we've had high, uh, high numbers in the spring. And in some really mild winters, we've had lower numbers. One point that kind of jumps out is this uh, the coldest year among those uh, surveyed was the 2018 year, where it got down uh, into the teens throughout much of the, the industry. And in that year, we didn't find a single dead heart or larvae in any of the, the fields we surveyed. So it does suggest that at very low temperatures, the spring population uh, might be reduced. The reason I think this relationship um, is is not really significant is that it really has to be very cold to kill these larvae. These are Mexican rice boar mortality rates at, at 23 degrees. And you can see even after five straight days at this temperature, uh, we're only getting just under 20% mortality. So most of these larvae are able to survive general normal freezes for South Louisiana uh, without any problem. The sugarcane boar is slightly less cold tolerant, but would also survive at similar rates. And so only when it gets uh, exceptionally cold is winter mortality going to be a, a major factor here. What is related to uh, spring boar populations is environmental conditions in the spring, uh, particularly rainfall in April. I think in May it's also related, but we take these surveys in May. And so if you have uh, plenty of rain and the cane is growing well in April, those conditions are, are good for boar survival. 
Uh, it also can dis rainfall disrupts the foraging from fire ants. Uh, the most of the industry has plenty of rain this spring. Uh, in April, I think eight to ten inches was pretty common. So that would suggest uh, conditions are favorable for the first spring generation. And these dead heart counts are correlated here to the percentage of treated acreage in the summer. So they do provide some indication of, of what to expect and how much you may need to be spraying. What to anticipate this year, uh, it's hard to say. We haven't gotten out to, to take our dead, our dead heart surveys yet. We hope to do that soon. I suspect similar to what we saw in 2018, we'll find low numbers in the spring. Uh, however, in that year, populations did recover and we still treated about a quarter of the acreage uh, that summer. And so I think you're still gonna have to scout fields and plan on spraying some of the uh, most susceptible varieties. Again, it's, it's more spring and summer conditions that determine this pest pressure than winter. Uh, so wet conditions in the summer are going to favor sugarcane borer. Uh, areas that are much drier might see more Mexican rice pole infestations. Uh, one thing we're seeing early this spring that's fairly uh, uncommon is really high infestations of fall armyworms in, in cane, which is not uh, something we see every year. Sometimes we'll see them in, in the fall but not often in the spring. And I think this is because sugarcane is, is not really a preferred host of armyworms. They prefer more softer vegetative tissues like young rice seedlings or, or young corn. But this year they appear to be uh, fairly prevalent in some areas and causing some concern. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that Fall armyworms aren't impacted by winter conditions in most of the U.S. at all. This is a, a migratory insect that is a, is a real good flyer. They can fly long distances. And so they actually recolonize most of the, the U.S. every year from uh, continuous populations in the southernmost parts of the states, uh, Texas and South Florida, as well as Mexico and, and Puerto Rico could be added here too. And so they arrive fairly consistently into the same areas every year. At our latitude, uh, we see both the Florida and Texas populations coming together and typically arriving in April and May. Got a video here from Randy. Hopefully I'll be able to play it. Gotta get off my laser pointer to present it. And so this shows you that's the larvae there feeding uh, right on the growing portion of that plant. And he's heavily defoliated a lot of those plants and uh, reduced a lot of that, that spring growth that had begun. Here will pan out and you can get an idea of just how much defoliation has occurred in this field. There's just not a lot of green cane left on on that row, and this was throughout the whole field. So I think this is certainly a situation that would be concerning and warrant potential insecticide application. Uh, you can see how much that growth has been re removed on some of some of these plants. So, what are the impacts going to be to yield? Uh, you know, cane can recover from quite a bit of defoliation once it really gets moving in the summer. However, I think in that case, you've probably lost a whole month or close to it of, of spring growth. And so while I would expect it to recover, I think you're probably going to have some yield loss. Now, how much had already occurred before they were able to spray and how much did they prevent uh, is hard to, hard to predict. But I think uh, in cases where it's that severe, uh, insecticide application is justified. Uh, pyrethroids are labeled and they're fairly effective. They're not 
great. Uh, Previton would be another option. It's much more expensive, but I think uh, particularly if you've got a bore susceptible variety, it might be justified because it could carry over and provide some, some early season protection from bores. Uh, some of our other pests, aphids, uh, these typically, both species aren't particularly impacted by winter. Actually, the yellow sugarcane aphid occurs throughout the country up to New York and all the way west to Washington and throughout the U.S. Uh, so it survives winter temperatures here in South Louisiana without issue. Typically, uh, these pests show up almost every spring in some fields, as well as in fall plant cane. Uh, this picture doesn't show up great, but they have this reddening and yellowing of leaves, discoloration that's fairly diagnostic. Typically, I think uh, while they do kind of bang up, thing up the cane in the spring, I don't think uh, this translates into any significant yield loss in those cases. Uh, the sugarcane aphid does not overwinter uh, much north of here. However, this insect has a very fast generation time, so even if uh, overwintering is minimal, they can recover rapidly uh, during the spring and early summer. And typically, we see the worst infestations uh, around July and into August. Uh, hot and dry conditions typically worsen those infestations. The one uh, area where I do think we're going to have a benefit from this winter freeze is with the West Indian cane fly. Uh, as the name suggests, this is a, predominantly a pest in the Caribbean, but in recent years it's been more problematic uh, for us in Louisiana. And unlike the aphids, these are plant hoppers. They have much longer life cycles, so they're not able to recover quickly from high winter mortality. And almost all the evidence from previous outbreaks are following mild winters where you've had not just no freezes, but you've really had green cane present uh, throughout the winter and then good spring growth uh, in the early part of the spring that allows substantial populations to even start being present uh, early in the spring. So I think we probably will get a break from the West Indian cane fly uh, if we're going on based on previous history. Uh, now just to touch on some uh, ongoing work and work we're moving into, we hope to do some more wireworm research this year. Uh, this has been kind of an understudied area here in Louisiana. We don't have a good idea of yield loss and uh, where insecticides are going to be needed. And this is uh, particularly relevant now as we're looking at getting some new products registered. Uh, platinum, I'm told, is still moving forward for inferro use uh, in sugarcane at planting, and that's going to be a wireworm product. And also we are looking at IR4 funding for proflanilide. And so we're looking to get some efficacy trials done uh, with that product as well. We're looking potentially for field research sites. Uh, you know, doing things on commercial farms is great. With the EPA funding these trials, I, I think it's likely they're gonna have to uh, have those plots destroyed and so a lot of that work we'll probably do on station, but we are still looking for potential collection sites where we can uh, trap and collect larvae to inoculate plots on station. Uh, so if you've got growers in your area that have typically had wireworm issues or think they've got uh, high infestation potential at their farms, uh, please let me know. We're, we're looking for sites to collect larvae and we're going to start that uh, work probably next month. So. Uh, continuing looking for sites that we might be able to utilize for wire lines. But if you think the league and, and all the support staff, and I'll uh, turn it over to Hannah and then we can take questions after that. I know we're a little behind. But that's all I have.